G'day, welcome back to the Dive Channel, part two of an introduction to rebreathers. G'day there, I've come into the study today, it's too cold out in the shed, and to be honest, I don't need to be surrounded by the rebreathers this morning, because really I want to talk to you about some more philosophical issues around rebreather diving. The cold hard facts of the matter are that rebreather diving is associated with an increased risk of uh, accidents and even fatalities compared to normal open circuit scuba diving. And it's important that you understand that as you embark on your rebreather journey. And there's a few questions you need to ask yourself uh, as you start to look into rebreathers and rebreather diving. I think the first thing to ask yourself is why do you want to dive a rebreather? Um, and there are, there are lots of really good reasons to do it. And even just because you find the technology fascinating and you're a bit of a gear freak, uh, you like uh, delving into the nuts of, and bolts of complex equipment and, and look, that's fine. And that's certainly part of the reason why I got involved. As an anaesthetist, I found it fairly intuitive uh, because rebreathers are essentially an anaesthetic machine. But um, you do need to be aware that there are some increased risks in using rebreathers compared to normal scuba equipment. And uh, that, that became clear in a 2013 paper written by a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Andrew Fock, who wrote uh, a, uh, a paper on analysing rebreather fatality statistics and found that it's possible that there were upwards of tenfold increase in, in the risk of uh, fatality if you're using that kind of equipment. Now there's a lot of information behind that, that simple statistic, but it's certainly worth reading that paper to get an idea. The important thing is that most of those errors came from uh, the divers themselves. And so there's a couple of books I'd suggest that you have a read of as you uh, embark on this journey. Um, one of them is a, um, a, a fantastic kind of introduction into rebreather diving called Mastering Rebreathers. And I might've mentioned it in the last talk by um, uh, Jeff uh, Bozanek. And um, that's just like, it just covers every little bit of information about the practicalities of rebreathers and rebreather diving. And although it's getting a little bit out of date, there's still a lot of really important information. But equally, if not more important, is some of these books like um, uh, Gareth Locke's book on, on uh, human factors in, in diving uh, called Under Pressure. And that starts to get into the, um, you know, the more psychological influences on accidents and decision, poor decision making. Uh, and the third book, which I don't have with me at the moment, is The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. And uh, again, that's really uh, interesting insight into uh, how we make decisions under pressure and, and how things can go wrong, especially when we're using complex systems or complex equipment. So have, have a think about reading some of that sort of stuff just to get your, your mind in the right place uh, as you go down this path. Now, as I mentioned, there's lots of good reasons to use rebreathers. And the obvious one is that they don't really form uh, or create any bubbles, which is fantastic if you're into your photography or video. Uh, you'll see that marine life behaves in a really different way around you, especially big animals like sharks. They're far more likely to come in close and have a look at you because normally they seem to be really frightened of your bubbles. Um, if you're in a, uh, a cave or a, a wreck or another overhead environment where silting is an issue, you know, the fact that there's no, no or very few bubbles uh, coming out of the rebreather actually is an improvement in, in safety in those environments. And for me, the big safety advantage uh, over open circuit uh, um, scuba diving is the fact that essentially the duration uh, you have underwater is unlimited. I mean, obviously it, has, it is limited, but uh, compared to a, a scuba tank uh, ticking down, as uh, particularly in deep water, it is very reassuring psychologically and in order to avoid uh, stress and eventually panic if you know that you have all the time in the world to solve any problems like navigational issues or silting or, or those sorts of things. You get a little bit stuck in a, uh, in a restriction and knowing that you've got a couple of hours to sort it out if you need it is very important in fact in keeping your stress levels under control and at the end of the day many divers have died with you know full scuba tanks and we know that uh, panic can be fatal in and of itself so the, that advantage of, of the rebreather should not be underestimated and in my view actually there are some dives that are 
you know, um, undoubtedly safer on rebreather than they are on uh, normal scuba equipment. And that includes, includes very deep diving and uh, some forms of uh, uh, diving in overhead environments. And mainly for the reasons that I've just discussed. So um, you've made the decision to, to get into rebreathers. The next question I would ask you to, to consider is what kind of person am I? Um, now, if you are used to uh, coming home from your, your crayfish hunting dive and you sort of chuck your gear in, in the bucket in the shed, sometimes you wash it, sometimes you don't. Um, if, you, if you're that kind of person, you should admit that to yourself and, and be prepared to say that rebreather diving may not be for you or it's going to take a significant change in uh, in your habits and, and personality uh, and and that is because rebreathers are far more complex equipment and they need to be maintained extremely uh, well and they need to be checked extremely carefully uh, before every trip and before every dive and if you're not prepared to do that if you're not the sort of person who took up under underwater photography because you just couldn't be bothered with all cleaning of those o-rings and uh, being a bit ocd about preparing equipment like that then again perhaps rebreathers aren't for you and, and i think it's important to be honest with yourself um about that because you know it is life support equipment and if you're not prepared to spend the time tinkering with it then it um you know it becomes unreliable and you do need to be a bit obsessive you know you need to be prepared to spend the uh, you know the three hundred and fifty dollars a year to replace the cells. You need to be prepared to you know religiously change the the soda lime in the scrubber, even if you think it would probably you know do one more dive. You definitely if that word probably comes into it, then then the answer is just change it and uh, you know err on the safe side, because it's those sorts of misjudgments and errors that cost divers their lives. So speaking of, you know, preparing rebreathers for the dive and uh, in the next video, we can go through some of this in, in a practical sense. Just a, a, a quick word on checklists that I've already mentioned. Now, checklists are something that are increasingly being discussed in rebreather diving and unquestionably play a very important role in keeping divers safe. You know, a number of fatalities have occurred in divers from jumping into the water uh, without turning the oxygen cylinder on, something as simple as that. Um, not changing their cells at the 12 month period, not uh, checking that the gas in their cylinder is the same as the gas on their computers, not calibrating uh, the rebreather before the dive. All these little things that should be um, very intuitive and um, you, know, you know, seem very simple, you only have to forget one of those things and it can really come back to bite you. And, and sadly, a lot of divers have lost their lives because of very simple omissions like that. And um, myself, I'm happy to admit, I've, I've made some stupid errors uh, in rebreather diving that have given me significant frights. Obviously, I'm still here to tell the story, but complacency without question is uh, one of the biggest risks in rebreather diving and checklists help avoid that, uh, that complacency. And the times I've run into strife have actually been on the very simple shallow dives when I've assumed everything would be all right because it's just a quick, easy dive to do uh, some little task. And I've chucked the rebreather on and uh, headed off without going through that, that rigorous process, which I definitely do when I'm looking at a, you know, a bigger exploration dive, for example. So you need to be uh, open to you know, criticizing yourself and admitting that uh, you are fallible and uh, always insist on, on, on doing, taking those precautions. And importantly, try and surround yourself with people who feel the same way, who will actually pull you up if you if they see you not doing the right thing. Um, I tell you, they are the best friends to have in the long run. Checklists are widely available. All the rebreathers that can be commercially purchased come with a checklist and uh, they're actually all available online for free as well. And just a few examples I've, I've got here to show you. Um, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the checklist for my uh, Triton chest mount rebreather. Um, the uh, sort of generic uh, KISS rebreather checklist and a uh, fairly comprehensive uh, Megalodon checklist. Uh, what I'll try and do is absolutely use these, these checklists at the start of an expedition, for example. I'm going away for a week before I even get on the plane or, or, or in the car. I'll get the checklist out and go through the rebreather with a, you know, go over it with a fine tooth comb and make sure that every single little thing on this checklist has been uh, has been ticked off. 
The problem with checklists is that they can be their own worst enemy if they are really overcooked, if they are so complex and thorough, you know, checking every little tiny nut, bolt and O-ring on, on the unit, um, people, uh, you know, human nature being what it is, inevitably people will shy away from, from using them because they're too much of a hassle. So by all means use that checklist the first time you get the rebreather out, it hasn't been used for a couple of months, you're about to go on a trip, absolutely do that, um, you know, they, that rather excruciating checklist, uh, you know, that's really important. But it's more important perhaps in terms of safety overall is to have simple checklists like these, which are, um, you know, the, the absolutely critical things that have to be checked to keep you alive and to prevent 99.9% .9 of the common types of, of accidents. There's always the potential for what we call a lightning strike, that thing that you can't anticipate or just, you know, is so uncommon that it's essentially not worth um, checking for. <clears throat> but the common things occur commonly. And, um, you know, the fatality reports have, have a half a dozen things that are at the top of the list and, and these checklists cover those things off. Um, and I've actually got two sorts of checklists for that um, kind of situation. The first one, a slightly more comprehensive one that I would definitely do once I arrive at the dive site. Let's say, um, you know, I'm in a remote location, get the rebreather out of the car. It's already had that very complex checklist done back at home, but I've just arrived on site and I need to make sure that nothing's been bumped, moved or, or disrupted uh, during the trip. So I'll go through this, you know, moderately comprehensive checklist recalibrate the unit because I might now be in a different uh, atmospheric pressure or, or altitude or something might have been knocked or, or bumped. But literally before I jump in the water, I'll have this short checklist. So to look at that in a bit more detail, um, you know, what we call a pre-jump checklist, that one you do immediately before you jump in the water. This one's designed by the Rebreather Training Council. Again, you can find it online. Um, and it just goes through a few things. Uh, the, the, the cylinder valves open, check the contents again. Uh, check uh, contents as in you know what gas is in there as well as as um, uh, you know the, the the pressure inside um, is the is the rebreather switched on is are the set point set to what you want uh, the gases on the on the computers set to what accurately reflects the gases on the rebreather um, and then do a pre-breathe on the rebreather which means putting the the mouthpiece in your mouth for you know a good several minutes and um, Part of that is, you know, traditionally that was taught to detect high levels of CO2 if there's a problem with one of the, the mushroom valves, the flapper valves in the mouthpiece, or if there's uh, an, even an absence of a, uh, a scrubber canister being put inside the, the can. Um, but in fact, uh, more recent research has shown that it's pretty hopeless at even detecting the lack of a scrubber uh, material inside the rebreather. But what it does do is uh, detect whether the oxygen uh, system is working properly, whether that's manual or electronic, and whether uh, the PO2 inside the loop is climbing as it should be. So you sit down there, and I tend to go through a mental, um, you know, rehearsal testing every single button on the on the rebreather while I'm doing that. Push the oxygen manual ad, uh, the the diluent manual ad if you have one of those. Check the bailout valve if you're using uh, a bailout valve type mouthpiece, and um, make sure the the oxygen levels in the loop are doing what you expect them to do whether that's on a manual or on an electronic rebreather all right so that's uh just a quick look at safety and rebreathers um i want everyone out there to be to be safe with their rebreather diving and it's very important that you have a, just a good think about you know why you're embarking on this on this journey and recognize faults within yourself within your your dive group and uh, look after each other out there, use your checklists and stay safe. Thanks very much.